Do you like wrestling trivia? Then check out the five-star match game, the Pro Wrestling Quiz Show. I'm Joe Gagne, and every episode, I grill three contestants with five rounds of power-packed wrestling trivia. We have over 30 evergreen episodes in the archives covering WWE, AEW, Japan, Mexico, and much, 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 much more. Play along at home and check it out today. Hi, I'm Kay Slow, co-host of the Open the Voice Gate podcast. The one question I'm constantly asked when it comes to Dragon Gate is how do I get into the promotion? Well, stop asking and start listening to the Open the Voice Gate podcast released every Wednesday on the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. For exclusive news and show reviews, look no further than the leader in Dragon Gate coverage, Open the Voice Gate. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Welcome back to another episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Hungi here on the Voice of Wrestling Podcasting Network. If you didn't know, Google Podcasts is dead, and you can find us on YouTube, where we have a playlist of every single show. It'll, it's very easy to find. We'll include a link in the show notes. But just for all those people, we haven't gone anywhere, we promise. My name is Tyler Fornis. With me, as always, is Fred Moreland, who has the same energy as the Sleepy Time T-Bear. How are you, sir? I'm doing all right. How are you? Well, I, I have less energy than the sleepy time tea bear because I am. <laughs> I think you'd be comatose. Uh, oh, hey, so that since, is actually inaccurate. <laughs> yeah, since last week, it's it's been a whirlwind with the with the dogs. Um, Eclair had two seizures, one Thursday night, one Friday morning, and it's just trying to get her in a in a good spot and figure out what's causing them has been it's been it's been a little rough. But I got both dogs sleeping next to me right now, and we're in a good place. That's good. That's good. Well, uh, we had ourselves a little war, and uh, I don't think there's any way you can say AEW didn't lose that war. They went head-to-head last Tuesday. We talked about how we were happy to escape the rating talk, but we should talk about the ratings because it's it's mm-hmm. news and uh, it's important, and uh, we just are avoiding getting sucked into uh, the muck that is just the stupid discourse sometimes, but this past week, uh, NXT, uh, you know, on its usual Tuesday night, ran against Dynamite, which was, uh, of course, displaced by a night because of, uh, you You said the NFL in the episode description last week, Tyler, you fool. Uh, but it was... Uh, uh, well, why, I don't even know why I would have said NFL because you just it was there. NHL. Yeah. And was, I was even wrong then. It was baseball. Yeah. So <laughs> some damn sport. Uh, At least F and H are somewhat in the kind of same area on the keyboard but yeah that that was a big goof by me (laughs) uh it's gonna bury you casually as i go over these ratings but yeah (laughs) uh nxt uh had uh overall 921,000 viewers with a 0.30 in the key demo of 1849 year olds and uh dynamite had a 609,000 uh viewership overall with a 0.26 in the 1849 demo uh, now, if you compare that with last year's Tuesday Night War, uh, Dynamite won that one. They uh, had 752,000 overall with a 0.26 in the key demo, the exact same number. Uh, while NXT uh, was at 676,000 and 0.18 in the 1849. Um, I think this is uh, indicative of a few things. First of all, uh, that NXT at WWE in general is just hotter than it was last year, and it's definitely hotter than AEW is right now. Um, and also, I think it also indicates that uh, WWE tried this time, and they really didn't last year, which is very un WWE like. But they didn't really put much effort into it last year. They may have announced a couple like big matches within the realm of WWE, you know, or I should say within the realm of NXT 2022. But this year, they pulled out a bunch of cards. They had uh, Cody Rhodes, Paul Heyman, Asuka, The Undertaker come out and, uh, you know, help make a star by chokeslamming Braun Breaker. Um, Nothing like making a new star by having him get buried by a dude who's been retired for three years. Yeah, I know. 
WWE is such a bizarre company. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they, you know, AEW lost. Uh, there's not a real easy way to spin it. Now, I will say overall, not close. Um, and, you know, I neglected to mention Dominic Mysterio and Becky Lynch are now uh, pretty regularly in NXT, and that helped out too. Um, and, uh, you know, just looking at the dumpers, you got to say that uh, WWE is much better in popularity right now than AEW. That said, I think it does mean a little bit. The one glimmer of good news here is that WWE tried really hard. And AEW put out a, a big show for them, but they didn't really hot shot anything. I don't think any kind of major, like there wasn't like a Hogan Goldberg, you know, in the Atlanta Dome um, kind of deal here. But, you know, they uh, they stayed close in the key demo. Uh, 0.04, not a bad loss. Uh, I honestly, I wrote, you know, now two weeks ago leading up to the show that, uh, you know, WWE kind of put themselves in a position where they could have had some real egg on their face if they had not won because of all the how stacked they were making that card. And I still think that a little bit that um, this isn't exactly what they probably had in mind when uh, they, they stacked it that much in terms of the key demo. Uh, that's the only kind of thing I can say about it as far as a pro AEW slash anti WWE thing. Uh, but they, yeah, I mean, WWE whooped their ass, basically, especially overall. And, uh, you know, they practically, uh, in, you know, they increased their uh, viewership overall by practically uh, 50% um, year over year. And, uh, yeah, um, I don't know. I think it's just a reflection of what the wrestling industry is like right now. AEW has cooled tremendously in the past 12 months and um wwe has gotten hotter um i think wwe has kind of stagnated basically since wrestlemania ish and i feel like AEW isn't really uh sinking in that same time period i think they're about steady as well but yeah you know, this is just where they are when i take a look at these ratings it demo wise like AW is within shouting distance. I think the numbers that Brandon Thurston released was like 391 to 314. Mm-hmm. Like, and and that would like, no, maybe it was 319 to 340. Like it, it was it was close. Like it and obviously just being 0.04 away, that that's around like that 50,000 mark. So looking at that and then looking at the disparity in total viewers, look, the olds watch NXT. And the olds have never been a demographic that AEW has consistently been able to grab. And one thing we that's been a humongous talking point for the entirety of this company, anytime there's a cultural event or anything else going on on that night, and we've seen it with Collision in WWE because there's more crossover now than there was before, that a WWE event will supersede what AEW is doing. And... That's fine. I don't necessarily think that's the end of the world. I also don't think it's something that you have to really worry about per se. Because it's like, okay, you're going to lose people to WWE. Well, just keep your people. Keep your fans, the ones that you have been able to cultivate over the last five-ish years. Or even longer, because let's be honest, being the elite was kind of... it, It feels like that was kind of the renaissance. And then that snowballed into All In... And then, like, obviously the massive success of Bullet Club worldwide. And you take a look at all those things. And that's your your main core fan base. And obviously there's crossover. American professional wrestling in this kind of context is going to have that no matter what. But going against a WWE show, look, I'm not going to say that AEW mailed it in. But they obviously didn't try to put their best foot forward. There was no Omega Wrestling on the show. The Young Bucks didn't appear. And Adam Cole's doing his stupid little pre-tapes. They put together a really solid show. They just didn't try to load up like WWE did. So WWE winning and getting all the olds, which is really what the nostalgia comes from. Nostalgia is for the olds. It's for people like us. Like my formative years of wrestling, like John Cena and AJ Styles were probably my two favorite wrestlers. Like, 
if you get John Cena on a show, I, someone like me is going to be a lot more likely to watch because that was my formative years of wrestling. You say that, but I, I can point to stuff like uh, when WWE was bringing in a retired flair for uh, for stuff like it would pop the ratings of uh, like teenagers. Um, yeah, just it's a weird thing, but uh, it does undercut that a little bit. How dare you tell me I'm wrong, Fred? How dare uh, I love doing it. It's really I know fun. you do. You really enjoy it. Yeah. But maybe the data doesn't match up. And if it doesn't, like, like you're saying, I'll take the L. But it feels like when you see a lot of that nostalgia, you're getting it from people like, oh, they're going to be on the show. Let's check it out. And then like with WWE, we've seen them load up shows like and this isn't the best example because it was the first show on Fox, but they did 4 million and they dropped to 2.4 or 2.6. And then they settled in around two to 2.2 and they built that back up with the success of the bloodline, but they really loaded up that first show. And then afterwards they just kind of, they felt like the second show was punted. And when you look at all those different elements, I get it. But I'm very intrigued to see what NXT does next week because it wasn't even like like Cody Rhodes announced he was the GM of the Dusty Rhodes Classic. And Paul Heyman was Braun Breaker, like in uh, Carmelo Hayes' corner and Cena was in Braun Breakers or maybe it was vice versa. I don't even remember. But they were just corner men. They -hmm. weren't doing anything on the show. And Undertaker just came out and beat the shit out of your big baby face. What are we doing? Like, that doesn't help build your product. And that's why I'm I'm just really confused as to what the whole idea is behind it. Like, what are you trying to build? Or are you just trying to pop a one-week rating? And D- um, Dynamite's ratings were really strong when they came back on Wednesday. And that's something that's getting lost in this whole conversation, is Dynamite was not on their normal night. Last mm-hmm. year, they, they each had... Uh, they had the one um, night against each other and dynamite had a world title match. It was in Cincinnati, John Moxie versus hangman, Adam page. Um, That was a planned match. It wasn't like shoehorned in or anything. They NXT didn't do anything really to combat it, but dynamite made it feel like a, a decent show. Like, you know, they do every so often with, with their television. 752,000 and a 0.26. And NXT did 676,000 with a 0.18. So even though Dynamite had the worst total viewership of all four of those shows, they still tied for second in the demo. Like, to me, this is a big nothing burger. This is kind of how we should have expected it to play out, Fred. And I have really no ifs, ands, or buts or concerns with numbers for either side i think what matters is what this week's numbers are and i didn't see what nxt's numbers were i don't know if you have that information offhand um i don't actually because dynamite did 901 in a point three one, i think mm-hmm. yeah pretty good numbers for a wednesday yeah like this isn't really um like <laughs> you know the old uh aw is dying you know they they definitely have uh the, the gap between them and WWE has grown. And it's basically, it was really growing, I think, at the start of this year. I think now it's just what it is. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, uh, NXT this week was 798,000 with a 0.23. So um, they're both doing well. I, I think the, the what I, my key takeaway from the change year over year is that. Um, Outside of the the diehard WWE guys, um, there no one really cared about NXT in 2022. But now they have Becky Lynch, they have uh, Dominic Mysterio, who I guess is something of a draw, which is crazy to me. Um, and uh, those two stars being brought over have really elevated it. Um, and uh, it's smart, actually, I think, because I, you know, if you want to maximize your TV money. You want that NXT number to be strong and uh, you need to actually put people on there that people care about. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's really uh, concerning for like Braun Breaker 
long term mm-hmm. or uh, as a future star, which I just don't see at all myself, um, or you know the various mm-hmm. other people on the show over the past year. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's fine. It's AEW is doing all right, and uh, I just uh, you know, I, it's every one off week is just like the Eric Bischoff special. You know, you can obsess over it and completely change the direction of your company, which is kind of silly, or you can just uh, run your own race and, uh, you know, try to focus on the big picture, which I think both companies, really, WWE and AEW are doing overall. Yeah. Honestly, it's a, the ratings, I think, really impressive demo number for AEW moving nights. Mm-hmm. Outside of that, yeah, I really have no issues. I, th- I think it good numbers for both sides, and both yeah. sides should be relatively happy with that. Let's take a look now at some other things. We kind of buried the lead here. The big news of the week. Sting is going to officially retiring. One thing he said, and he made clear to note when he retired um, from WWE, or when he was in WWE, excuse me, he said, one thing's for sure was Sting is, to never be sure, he clarified that one thing's for sure was thing is that I'm sure. And his last match will be three years from his first match with the company, Revolution 2024. Let's get a little hypothetical here. What do you think is going to be his last match? Because you would think Darby... But would he want to do like a like a Jushin Thunder Liger where he it's like a tag? Um, will we get like a mini like goodbye tour for Sting? Which I really don't think Sting cares about that. But I it wouldn't be for Sting. Mm-hmm. It would be for us. Yeah. And I, I'm curious to see how you think this is all going to play out. Uh, you know, it's it's going to be really interesting. Um, I've got to think that uh, they'll probably go with a tag match because Sting really hasn't done, I think, a singles match in his entire EW run, unless I'm blanking out here. But uh, I think it'll make it easier. Um, I think sticking with Darby will definitely help uh, float the quality of, um, you know, the uh, the match that he's in as a send-off. And... Uh, you know, the question is, uh, are you going to have Sting put someone over? Um, again, you know, the obvious person would be Darby Allen. They do a singles match and uh, Sting puts him over on his way out. Or um, you have him tag with Darby and maybe, you know, kind of buck tradition and go with the happy ending of uh, Sting getting a win on his way out. It's very interesting. Um and uh, I think that it's just a really, uh, you know, it's an interesting way to end just a wild career. Uh, Sting is um, just all the stuff he did and all the different things he touched and all the different aspects of his career have been really fascinating. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad we got this coda, this little uh, last couple of years here where he got to just, you know, show up every once in a while and just have crazy matches and, uh you know, I think he's obviously been a big boon for the company, I think, uh, just in terms of legitimacy. Uh, I, I don't know that he's like a huge ratings draw in general. Um, but, you know, I think he, every time he's had a match, it's it's hit. So, Yeah. And I could see a situation where Darby says, nope, I'm not losing the Sting. I won't do it. Yeah. And look, whatever they do... I feel like we can trust Tony Khan to treat with the reverence that it deserves because of how, and CM Punk, when he came into the company, talked about what sealed the deal for him was how they handled the passing of Brody Lee. And it's always with class. They do everything top notch in that that sense. Mm -hmm. And they're going to treat Sting with that kind of reverence. And I'm, I'm not excited to see Sting leave the company. I I'm, it'll be very sad to see Sting. Yeah, for sure. At the end of the day, if he's going to leave, they're going to treat him right on the way out, and you're, you're going to feel a lot better about it than you would have somewhere else. Yeah. And I like that. 
yeah um yeah he it's you know as someone who grew up watching sting um in fact sting is maybe the uh the first wrestler I really remember was seeing on TV um, in actuality uh, back in his WCW uh, surfer sting period. Um, it, yeah, it's uh, this guy has done so much in his career. Um, I'm glad he got voted into the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame. Um, you know, frankly, because uh, we had that, you know, for a long time there was a uh, a big um, debate about if he was a Hall of Famer, and he finally did get in. And uh, yeah, I just you know Sting's awesome, and I will miss Sting. Same. I'm I'm really gonna miss him. Uh, Sting was Sting's been everything that you could ask for, and it's been great to have him. In professional wrestling, it's been even better to have him throughout like so many formative years of wrestling because Sting has literally been wrestling across five decades. Five decades. Yeah. That's it's crazy. We're gonna ignore that Ric Flair's wrestled across six because Ric Flair should not have wrestled in the year of our Lord 2021. No, so, God, no. <clears throat> that's neither here nor there. Um, I'm happy that Sting is good with that decision because I highly doubt that Tony Khan told him, no, you need to retire. This is a, this is probably a Sting pick. And he seemed very comfortable with his decision as he announced it over the, um, which we call it, um, I don't even remember what I'm saying because I am so zoned out. Um, what he said in, in the live crowd on uh, yeah on Wednesday night. That is what I was trying to say. Say. Well, uh, next up we have uh, I think the other big news story of the past week, which is the revelation that uh, Vince got got. Uh, Vince McMahon, uh, who was promised that he would be able to do whatever he wanted with WWE after the merger with TKO, has been reportedly removed from the head of creative spot in WWE by uh, the CEO of TKO, Ari Emanuel, um, with Paul Levesque replacing him uh, for real this time, apparently. <laughs> and um, I don't know, this is just a huge story, and uh, it's kind of being overlooked because this is literally... You know, this is a sign that WWE is not a McMahon organized organization anymore uh, for the first time in either of our lives, Tyler. Um, and uh, it's just crazy to think about it. And it looks like that uh, Vince McMahon got played for the first time, really, in his life. Um, Since Jeff Jarrett kept bouncing back and forth between WCW. Yeah, if we're going to count that as that, I mean, uh, you know, it's a wild end to one would assume his career. Um, maybe, uh, maybe he'll bounce back from this. You know, he is very uh, Donald Trump like, and that nothing seems to really stick to him, and he always floats. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just fascinating, um, fascinating news, and. Apparently, an end of an era, um, and frankly, the end of AW's greatest competitive advantage, um, because for the periods when Vince was in control of WWE Creative, uh, that was a boost to them because they picked up so many great talents that WWE just somehow didn't see anything in. Uh, Adam Cole and Swerve Strickland, chief among them, both are main event level guys that uh, you know uh, WWE cut. Um, Adam Cole, who was to be a manager for Bearcat Keith Lee. Oh, God. Another big whiff. Uh, and uh, Swerve Strickland as the head of uh, Hit Row. Um, with B-Fab and Top Dalla and Ashante the Adonis. Um, who, I like Ashante. I hope they're 
doing good wherever they are right now. Um, but yeah, they, you know, they got to get pick up all these major league talents that uh, left WWE. And, you know, you can also point to like Christian Cage being, you know, first of all, forcibly sidelined essentially by WWE. And then, um, you know, always being undervalued by Vince and uh, on arguably the best run of his career now. Um, uh, Brian Danielson, you know, always not really fitting into WWE fully. Like he did well there, but like they never really created him like Brian Danielson and uh, coming to AEW to wrap up his career full time. Um, and uh, I don't know. I just think it's really interesting. Um, and uh, in a way, this is bad news for AEW. Because they don't get that boost of uh, Vince being just a crazy person who can't, you know, constantly changes his minds and doesn't really have, uh, I think, a great uh, uh, eye for talent. This, you know, in the modern era, and uh, I think Triple H's booking is kind of boring and staid. But he, to his credit, you know, puts together solid enough shows and. Uh, and, um, you know, doesn't incredibly own himself with uh, bad decisions in terms of uh, to, to keep under contract. Mm-hmm. Look, I think you said it well. This is not great for AEW, but I also don't think it's some mitigated disaster either. No, no. Um, I, my theory is Ari Emanuel basically took the PR hit saying that they were going they were going to keep Vince around um, to buy the company and then once everything was secure and there was no going back then they started doing the real things that they wanted which it's corporate America this kind of shit happens with a murder all the time mm-hmm. and I think that's kind of what we're looking at here and it's good get him out Vince is bad for business when it comes to WWE. Why is he bad for business, you say? He's nearing 80 years old. He's lost touch with pro wrestling and what fans actually like really like in pro wrestling. He's mismanaged his roster for the better part of a decade. And now, could things change with Triple H? I'm not convinced they will, but that doesn't mean they won't. And without Vince really having any impact on creative, maybe we can finally start to see some things change. And we'll we'll see what that looks like because Vince is now having to deal with his own overlords. It's not mm-hmm. um, just stockholders anymore. He's got actual bosses, yeah. which is something he hasn't dealt with since he bought the company from his dad in the late 70s. And just it's just a fascinating dichotomy here. I'm very intrigued to see what ends up happening long term here. And if Triple H can actually show that he's a, a quality booker for a long stretch, man, that could really change the game. Yeah, I, I think we kind of know what Triple H is as a uh, booker, you know, off of years and years in NXT and uh, what we've seen from the various periods where Vince has not been uh, running creative in WWE over the last couple of years where, you know, after spinal surgery or, uh, uh, you know, kind of getting uh, out, ousted from his own company briefly before he was like, I own all the stock and I'm you got to let me back in. Um yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's it's stayed. It's not particularly interesting. It feels like stuff doesn't progress. It's kind of my take. Uh, and when it does, it's at a glacial pace. But I think he, uh, like I said, he just doesn't make the same destructive decisions that Vince does. And, mm-hmm. you know, we I think we talked about this way early on in our show about how you know, the bar for for Triple H as a booker is underground, you know, for uh, oh, for, for succeeding Vince. And, you know, I think uh, at this point, we're just kind of like a lot of fans are just like, we're, you know, you, you could tell them that Vince is gone and just not change anything. And uh, arguably at some points the past year, it's been like that. Uh, and they'd be extremely happy. Um 
And, you know, Joe Lanza has been yelling a lot on um, his Thursday Dynamite reviews about how, you know, fans of the Adam Cole type stuff, you know, the, the Roderick Strong, next Strong gimmick stuff, they're just uh, WB fans who didn't want to be associated with Vince. Um, so Joe Lanza yelling? You <laughs> say it ain't so. I know. Uh, I can't really disagree with them, frankly. I, I no. you know, we'll get into some later, but I just missed up working i don't think but yeah um a fascinating potential end to an era uh that has really defined american wrestling you know for for decades and uh so kind of amazing that it's not getting talked about as much that's just my take um mm-hmm. let's go through some more news and then we'll get to the shows um got a lot of shorter notes this week uh Fire away. You know, when we uh, when FTR dropped the tag belts to Ricky Starks and um, Big Bill, uh, the patron saint of the good, the bad, and the hungry, um, yeah, we 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 assumed uh, that they were working an angle that they were working an angle based off of an actual injury to Cash Wheeler's ribs, but Dave Meltzer has reported that actually neither uh, Hair or Bald are injured, um, and that it was an idea they are banged up. But they're not uh, neither injured to the point of like having to take time off. So uh, Cash, I think it was, uh, according to Meltzer, pitched the match as a way to put the team over uh, Bill and Starks over Strong uh, and to kind of liven up Collision. Um, interesting, I thought, because I was convinced it was because of an actual rib injury to Cash. Um, that's some interesting booking. I, you know, I think I like it. Um, I. You know, I could actually undercut the argument he made for it, putting them over strong as if the basis of the match is that, you know, FTR is hurt going in, then it kind of undercuts the strength of the victory, I guess. But I do think it was a big moment on collision. I think it was very different from, a, you know, you, you need these short matches sometimes just to keep uh, fans honest so that people will stay invested early in a match. And uh, I think it was a, that part was a smart bit of business. I agree. I I agree completely. Um, my brain is just so fried, and I am just so happy that um, GBH star um, Big Bill is a tag team champion. That I like how unselfish they were with that. And yeah, yeah. It's a really uh, look. I, I'm not burying them. To be clear, I, I no, no, you know, no. I, I know you're not burying them. I, I just want to point out, like, yeah, it the, is really cool. What they did. The tag team division as a whole has been really, really giving. Yeah, Young Bucks put over a lot of people. Um, FTR, I think, have done a lot to make some people shy. You, you definitely can't knock FTR for being selfish. I don't think, and I don't think you can really knock the Bucks for being selfish either. Um, and uh, yeah, I thought this was uh, this was uh, learning that was cool, and it was a very interesting booking idea, and I think interesting in a good way. Um, next news note: uh, Tony Khan, uh, after they lost last week, kind of went on a on a stretch on uh, Twitter. Um, most of it funny, sometimes kind of like sweaty. Like when he was like, oh, this breaks the streak of The Undertaker and John Cena both showing up on a show and not drawing a million viewers. And it's like, buddy, you lost to that. So just kind of making yourself look worse there. Um, but he did mention that he he took uh, he, he the alleged WWE tampering that took place um, about last year, I think it was, with uh, Swerve Strickland, William Regal, he took personally because it happened around the hospitalization of his mother with a stroke. Um, uh, now, frankly, I doubt, I highly doubt from WWE that that was a personal thing, that it was just them, you know, doing their stuff because they have a history mm-hmm. of tampering. Um, uh, um, but you know, I, I could d- definitely understand why, uh, TK would take it that way because, you know, your, your mother's ill, seriously ill. And, uh, you know, that kind of shifts your viewpoint on things but just a note there um did you watch collision this week tyler i have not been able to watch collision this week no 
Uh, watch the main event, and then you can skip the rest. Uh, that is the official GBH uh, recommendation. Um, but I will tell you, it's very interesting that uh, the lead announcer on the last collision was not Kevin Kelly. It was Tony Schiavone. Um, and in fact, when the main event of Brian Danielson and Swerve Strickland, which I thought was an excellent match, uh, took place, Jim Ross came out and he replaced Kevin Kelly. And I think that we actually have a new lead announcer on Collision. Apparently, uh, Skiavone went and told uh, Tony Khan that he'd like another shot at being the lead announcer. And he thought that it might be on uh, on Rampage, actually, when he suggested it. But uh, I guess uh, to his and everyone else's surprise, he became the lead guy on Collision. Uh, you, you know, I'm not sure what this means for Kevin Kelly long term. I don't know if this is a long term move or if it's just like a week or two or just something to change things up briefly. But I don't know. It's a situation to watch for sure. Uh, Kevin Kelly has been the target of a lot of criticism since he came in as the elite lead announcer of Collision. I will say I don't think he's exactly been uh, knocking it out of the park. I I don't think he's been terrible. Um. I, I know actual terrible announcers, and he is not at that level. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he's kind of been a poor fit so far. You, you know, the the transition from just doing whatever you want for a solid three hour block with no interruptions while doing New Japan commentary with no producers is very different from uh, going to AEW, which has its regular commercial breaks, and you are being produced uh, live on air. And I can definitely understand why that would be an adjustment period. I do think. Uh, towards the tail end of his run as the lead guy that he was doing better. Uh, I don't think it was like close to like the level of his new Japan stuff, but mm-hmm. fascinating. I think just a really interesting situation. Yeah. I, I'm not super concerned about Kevin Kelly long-term because we've seen him do such a really good job being produced. Yeah. When you look at like his run in ring of honor, which is what got him, the new Japan gig, his time in WWE, like the guy knows what he's doing. And I, I wonder if this was mainly like, Hey, we're going to give Shivani like a little bit of a tryout here and get him get, see kind of what we want to do here moving forward. I don't really find this insulting on Kevin Kelly more. So Tony Khan, just trying to figure out what, what fit works best here. And yeah, yeah, I'm not reading too much into it. Um, I, I'm really not. Yeah, I will say that I actually think Nigel McGuinness has improved a lot since he started. Yes. Uh, and uh, I, th- you know, I am in general way over the the heel commentator role. Uh, but I credit where credit is due. Uh, I think he's done very well with it. I think he's genuinely funny. It feels less like a knockoff of. Uh, of uh, Jesse Ventura, which is what it so often feels like, uh, that people are just trying to ape uh, Ventura. And uh, it's, you know, it, it's tiring to me as a longtime fan because it's been done for so long and, frankly, so uninterestingly a lot of the time. But I, I do like what Nigel is doing, and uh, I think he's uh, it's impressive. Um Okay, very interesting note I just grabbed from The Observer. And I actually have a second one to add on to this, uh, kind of adjacent to the AW verse. But Ray Phoenix took a, a booking for The Crash, uh, the Lucha Libre promotion, on November 3rd. And that is notable because if currently the politics of Mexico are that if you work for Crash, you do not work for AAA. Hmm. Uh, and if you'll remember, AAA stripped him of his championship, the the uh shoot the latin america one i think it was and then gave it to qt marshall um, well that was i thought that was because phoenix decided to leave the company well i think it's just uh yeah yeah i, I i'm not saying triple a fired him or anything but it was more a i'm i'm leaving and uh, then they're like well i guess we're vacating this Okay. Uh, and then they funny because it's triple A in 2023. They're like, we're going to make sure that this belt goes on a local guy who will always be on shows. And they put, <laughs> put, it, put it on QT Marshall, who is notable for being a not local guy who works for AW primarily. Um, but yeah, he, um, he also hasn't worked for triple A because he's been trying to establish residency in, uh, the United States. Um, and uh, trying to establish his residency here. 
um, and has been unable to leave the country. But he's now injured, so he had to drop the booking. Um, and I guess Andrade is uh, taking his place, who another person that uh, is has not worked for AAA in a long time. Uh, one other note uh, directly from the Observer this week that uh, I think is interesting, and it's very uh, adjacent to AEW. It's not very direct at all anymore. Uh, but Flip Gordon, a name I have not thought about in a hot minute, uh, of course, was kind of getting the new young guy rub on being the elite for a long time, like in the build-up to yep. the formation of AEW, and then awkwardly was never brought in. Um, it's because then- he had like a... Um- an extended contract with ROH. And then right. I don't know if he was mentioned in speaking out. Was he? Uh, I don't recall that. Now, a lot of people were. Uh, what I kind of recall with him was that he just was kind of an idiot, <laughs> uh, like a flat earther. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So like, which is obviously is, is not as bad as being an accused, uh, sexual, uh, you know, deviant criminal. Yeah. But it, it, he's a dope. <laughs> Um, uh, and he just never got a look at AEW. I don't think he ever worked in uh, the Ring of Honor once it became a Tony Khan thing. But uh, he announced that he is not taking any more independent bookings after uh, uh, November. Uh, well, maybe November. Um, interesting note. Uh, kind of curious if he's getting picked up by either AEW or WWE. Um, obviously, if he went to AEW, he could still do indies if he wanted to. Uh, WWE, not so much. Um, but the fact that he's calling, like, apparently his uh, November 8th booking in Fight Life Wrestling for Milldale, Connecticut, his last, his final indie match in Connecticut. So, I don't know. Uh, interesting. I think he'd definitely be a better pickup for NXT than Brian Pillman Jr. Uh, <laughs> Lexus so kept, King. Lexus King, named after his abusive stepfather. God. Uh, Lord Almighty. Um, Samuel Guevara is still not cleared from his concussion. They were trying to get him on dynamite this past week, but it just didn't happen. Uh, Kota Ibushi said, uh, that his contract with AW uh, allows him to live in Japan, he can work elsewhere, and he has a reduced number of dates with AW. Uh, there has been a settlement in the Luchasaurus mask lawsuit between the designers of it and AW regarding the use of that design, um, in things like merchandise. Uh, no real terms of the settlement have been announced, so I don't think he, either side is like ecstatic with it. Because <laughs> usually, when that stuff gets leaked, it's because one side or the other is like all hyped up and wants to flex on it. Uh, but you know, there you to go. me, this screams fair, yeah, where both sides aren't unhappy with it. And I think that's when you really get something like this where you don't get anything actually leaked, but it also could be gag ordered where. Tony Khan, it could be Tony Khan forked over a bunch of money, but you can't say a fucking word about it. Like, yeah. That, like when you talk about non disclosure agreements, and I know there's been a lot of conversation with that in professional wrestling with um, the, the sexual misconduct with Vince McMahon. One of the things with non disclosure agreements is all you have to do is sign and you get X amount of money. But if you talk, mm-hmm. you have to give that money back. So yeah. that could be something where. Tony Khan knows he's forking over a lot of money, but he doesn't want everybody else to know about it once something like this eventually comes back around. And bada bing, bada boom. Yeah. Uh, One of my favorite stories just along those lines is about the Ghostbusters theme song because uh, Ray Parker Jr., who had one hit was that song, uh, was sued by Huey Lewis of Huey Lewis in the News and accused him of, um, excuse me, uh, ripping off uh, I Want a New Drug. Uh, which was a pretty big hit back in the 80s for Huey Lewis. And then decades, like years and years later, like 10 or 15 years later, Huey Lewis talked about it in an interview, but they had an agreement to not talk about the settlement at all. And I think uh, Parker clawed some of that money back. So Mm -hmm. um, just deep 80s pop music lore in our wrestling podcast. Um, couple of Ring of Honor contract expiries, uh, or at least lower card AEW. VSK and Zach Clayton have both had their contracts uh, not renewed. Um, okay. <laughs> you know, I don't think either yeah. would really make a difference for the company. On that note, um, Fuego Del Sol did a good video on his YouTube that I would actually recommend talking about uh, 
the end of his uh, run with AW with him not ex- you know picking up the option on his contract and just talking about the scenarios uh, working with it, um, it kind of confirms that at least at the time Tony Schiavone was the the hatchet man. Um, you know, and there's been lots of talk about Schiavone being like the head of uh, talent relations and that kind of being his role. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, Fuego did a good video about it. Uh, not bitter at all. Um, I think that guy's caught something. Uh, I'm not going to say like he's going to be a main event or anything, but I could see him as like a solid mid card or somewhere in, in at least an impact sized promotion, if not bigger. I and think I hope Fuego in the X division and impact feels like it could be a fit. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, impact some of their talent decisions, like they brought in, um, just like bringing in Connor from the, uh, oh, what was that tag team? And, uh, oh, um, I was it the Ascension? Is that right? The That's Ascension, yeah, okay. dude. Uh, the Ascension were so great in NXT, and then they got to the main roster and they I- immediately became they got vinced, they got, they got vinced vinced. real hard. Um, Yuka Sakazaki is returning to action for Tokyo Joshi Pro. On October 27th, she's been out for several months with an injury. I forget the exact injury. Um, quick notes, like literally quick notes. Tonight on Rampage, assuming we released this on the 20th when we're recording it, is Mystico versus Rocky Romero in a best two out of three falls match. Get your full-blown CML fix on that show. Um, I- I'm hyped for that. That should be at least four stars, if not better. Uh, both guys have been having fantastic years in Mexico. Um, a strong recommendation ahead of time for anyone to watch this. I will bet money it's good. Other dates. Uh, Ring of Honor's final battle is on December 15th. Uh, there was an erroneous report, apparently, that it would only be on Honor Club uh, that got uh, corrected or something. I don't know exactly what happened, but yeah. Um, and uh, Battle of the Belts, number eight, uh, is tomorrow night after Collision. Um and uh, we get to watch such wonderful matches as Orange Cassidy defending the international championship against one of Brother Zay, Kip Sabian, or John Silver. Uh, I will say that those matches would each any of them would be solid, I think. But you know, I don't know anyone that's really excited about why should Brother I care? Brother Zay, I don't know why you're even doing a match, just announce a guy, have him win on Rampage, and then have him have their match. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Uh, Tony Khan loves his matches for matches. Uh, and then final note, which is kind of interesting. Serena Deeb was uh, reported to be backstage at Collision by Fightful. She had not been seen for almost a year in the company, uh, apparently over issues and not injury issues. Um, so something to watch going forward. Before we get to the actual shows, we got to talk about this new Western Kentucky college football helmet. <laughs> you just isn't, it, isn't it great? It is great. There is, um, for those unfamiliar, Western Kentucky has a mascot named uh, Big Red, which is just a big old red blob of a humanoid figure. It kind of looks like Grimace from the McDonald's. I know, yeah, but, like, but red, obviously. Uh, he is delightful, the best mascot in sports, period. Uh, and Western Kentucky is rolling out helmets uh, featuring Big Red, and they are the greatest things I've ever seen, including right above the visor where there's a little space having his eyes um, just so on it, a red patch. It's not just that they're doing helmets with Big Red. Each position group has a different character formation oh, I, of Big Red. Yeah, that's great, too. Oh. Yeah, It's so good. Um, college football is just fantastically dumb. Um, it's dumb in all the best ways. Yeah, it is. And I can't wait. I, I'm a big Western Kentucky guy. I love watching that offense, and that offense has really stalled the last couple weeks. Made me real sad. Yeah, but it's, I, okay. I'm I got. I'm going to get one college football thing in here. Uh, James Madison, arguably the best of the Group of Five teams. Seven mm-hmm. uh, zero just beat uh, Marshall, a good Marshall team last night. Um, should be ranked in the top twenty five after this week. Um, they will not be eligible for the postseason because of a very dumb NCAA rule 
that uh, when you go from uh, the one the FCS to the FBS, you go up to the big boy level, you are banned from postseason play for a couple years to try to discourage, like, I guess a cash grab because God forbid you have a cash grab in college football. Mm-hmm. Um, it sucks because they're a really good team. Um, that's it. That's my college football note of the a week. A very good team. They're seven really and good. Oh. They whipped a, a good Georgia Southern team uh, mm-hmm. this past Saturday. Like it was like forty three to thirteen, forty one to thirteen. I think it was just. I watched that game live. It was fun. Yeah. And went to Huntington last night and beat a, a a strong defensive Marshall team. Um, Marshall was without six starters, um, including star running back Rasheen Ali, which that's um, not good. <laughs> it screwed over my college fantasy team because they announced it got announced. 12 minutes before kickoff and i didn't see it until nine minutes after and i'm like oh man oh, shit well let's bury some wrestling shows uh not really uh i, okay, I thought dynamite I, was good not great yeah that's my take on dynamite i uh, collision i uh i thought was a kind of a not even a bummer i thought it was largely boring uh Ooh. more than anything else boring uh, is now, worse than bad it is yeah uh, Brian Danielson and Swerve Strickland saved that show, that match rocked. I think I went four and a half stars on it. Um, that it's like bottom end of the dynamite dozen list. If we're, you know, going with all shows, uh, like that territory, just a, a really, really fun match. Um, and literally nothing else on this show worthwhile. Um, and I'm kind of, you know, that's my, that's my collision recap <laughs> because everything else was like, a squash or like a solid Samoa Joe Willie Mac match or a solid Christopher Daniels Juice Robinson match. Neither of which were bad or anything, but like they were just there. There. You know. Um Samoa, you know, Samoa Joe in 2023, when he has his working boots on, has um has damn good matches. And I keep saying Swerve Strickland, it was Christian Cage and Brian Daniels. And I don't know what's wrong with me. There's probably people that have been screaming on at me on the show for like literally the 30 minutes because i think i made that mistake earlier so i'm just a stupid person so you know deal with it i don't know what else to say but yeah christian cage and brian danielson uh fantastic match strong uh strong recommendation okay now i'm embarrassed um (laughs) but yeah definitely the only thing off that match i would recommend and i did go four and a half on it um okay let's talk dynamite because that's the interesting show this week um uh you want to be negative first? You want to be chronological? You want to be positive first? Let's go chronological. Was, all right. Uh, I thought there was a fair bit good about this show, but the stuff that sucked, like, stuff sucked really bad. But we start with something pretty good, which is uh, Jay White and Pinta. Um, I thought this was a solid match. Uh, not as good as I had hoped it would be. Um, but, uh, you know, Jay White, uh, you know, his weakness is that he often has matches that are just good, but are too long and uh, really could have been excellent. And I thought this is a little bit of that. And uh, But he and Pinta had a good outing, I thought. I loved the chop exchange because now I understand that some individuals were a little down on it. They're like, ah, we see this all the time. Yeah, that's that's a fair critique. And I think yeah, it's sure. become a lot more common in professional wrestling. But when you look at the character of Jay White, and he's he's very arrogant. He's he claims he's the best. He's carrying around the world title when he's not even the champion. And he's looking at Penta and letting Penta just like load up and cock his arm before actually hitting him. Like to me, that's fine. I think that rocks. I think it it suits the character of Jay White really well. And because it suits the character, like, that rocks. Like, yeah. I, I, t- I thought the match was good. I gave it four and a quarter. I thought they worked really hard. Um, and more Penta, more Penta singles. Look, I don't hate the Lucha Brothers. I'm over the Lucha Brothers. Split them up for two years. I'll and tell you bring who. them back together. I'll tell you who's over the Lucha Brothers is Tony Khan. Um, <laughs> they have been mid-carded, brother. <laughs> um, I wonder if their tag team title run didn't do very well business-wise. I, you know, that'd be a bummer. Um, they're really good, and I, I don't really understand why they've been used the way they have largely in 2023. Like, if you want to take them in a different direction, sure. But 
anyway, um, yeah, I went three and three quarter on this. I thought it was fun. Um, hard, not like fantastic because I thought it was a little too slow, especially in that first uh, commercial pre-commercial portion. Um, and then we got ourselves a, a pretty good Juice Robinson Jay White promo afterwards. We have definitely dropped the coins. Please don't remember the coins. Um, Tony Khan would very much like you to forget the coins. Um, but they have shifted from that. Now he's got a TJ Maxx ring, which is a pretty good bit. Um, and, um, yeah, I thought I liked their promo on MJF. Um, I like the Bullet Club Gold Act. Uh, they've really kind of settled in and have found themselves, and I think it rules. And, um, yeah, thumbs up. Mm-hmm. As I <laughs> as I go into oblivion. Um, yeah. Th- Glad I could was, throw it to that. <laughs> this, this was great. Yeah, this is good. Um, we got MJF backstage with Renee. I thought this was a decent little promo. Um until the the claim stuff. Um MJF has gone full CM Punk in terms of like pooching himself on the show because you know he's has a lot of booking power and uh, he's tied in with the acclaimed he's tied in with Bullet Club Gold he's tied in with Samoa Joe he's tied in with Kenny Omega now uh he's tied in with Wardlow <laughs> like it's all like uh, he's tied in with Adam Cole Roderick Strong in the Kingdom um he is the the protagonist of AEW to like honestly outside of CM Punk's run on Collision where he also had like eighteen storylines uh, going on at once uh, we really haven't seen this in AEW before where like one guy was like I thought I think at least uh, uh, dealing with or having prominent interactions with so many different groups um, it's definitely an interesting uh, approach it's not really what I would do. Um, I, I always like it when it's a little more variety and, uh, you know, obviously not everything is happening at the same time, but it's all very much like MJF is, is not just the world champion, but like the most important person in the company. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, so we had a decent promo where he was talking about how he's not stupid, so he's not going to run out there to get beat down by four and one, uh, bullet club. But, uh, he will be going out to commentary later, and uh, if uh, Juice wins, he hopes he does so that they can face off next week. And then Max Caster uh, and the rest of the acclaimed walk in, and Caster does his awkward uh, kind of flirty uh, offers of help. Um, I, I don't love it. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's really great. Um, Feels like the beginning of a split to me. Yeah, I do wonder if they're they're doing like breaking up the acclaimed. Um, I think it might be time for that. I really think that uh, it, it worked short term, but I do think adding Billy Gunn was like maybe the death knell for the group because um, it feels like they've just over the past year have gotten colder and uh, less successful and less interesting because they wrestle basically the same match every time out now, and uh, you know that's because largely because Billy Gunn is. I mean, it's like mid fifties Billy Gunn, you know. Um, but doesn't feel like yeah. they really do storylines; they're just kind of there. And uh, I don't know. I get, it's not like they suck, but it's just not nearly as good as like it was when they first got the tag titles, and that's kind of a bummer. Um, it's one of those things. If you split them up, they're just going to become mid carters in the void. Like, yeah, they need an actual direction if they are going to do a breakup. Uh, I wonder if they see Max Caster as a star in the waiting uh, because he's been featured heavily on his own and that Anthony Bowens is not seen the same way. Uh, Bowens is, I think, the better worker. Um, And I think Bowens has more charisma than maybe he's being given credit for. Uh, But I think both guys are really good and promising. So we'll see. Uh, But it does feel like it's time to maybe uh, shake things up with him a little bit. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, next, we got uh, a hype video for Hikaru Shida and Ami Sakura, where uh, Excalibur had been drugged with Quaaludes right before it started, because it sounded like he was whispering in a closet somewhere, um, like a podcaster, doing the voiceover for this video. And then we got Ami <laughs> Sakura and Hikaru Shida. Uh, it was a nice little story. The, the, the content of the hype video did a good job of building this. Um, and I thought this was solid. I went three and a half on this. Uh, good work. Um, Let me ask you a question. 
Did it feel like some of their spots just kind of went in slow motion? Mm, I didn't feel that way, really. Maybe a little bit early, but... It it felt like like, everything was so technically sound, and that's something you'd expect from these two women. Mm -hmm. uh, Emmy Sakura is one of the most technically sound women in the world, if not the most. And Shida doesn't botch anything. Mm -hmm. And it just felt like some of their bigger spots were just in slow motion. Man, hmm. I, I don't I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just a me thing, but it, it felt like it, I, I gave it three and a quarter, and I thought the work overall was like very sound, but some of the some of it was just slow, and it, it kind of took me out of it. Yeah, I didn't have that issue myself, but um, you know, it, uh, yeah, I thought it was solid. I didn't think it was. Uh, Thought it was good, you know. That's all. I wouldn't really like tell you to rush out of your way to watch it, but I thought it was solid. Um, next up, uh, Adam Copeland sit down with uh, Renee. Um, this was a slower paced interview, uh, and I saw some pushback on it because of that. Frankly, I, th- I kind of liked it. Uh, I thought I liked good- it too. Now, I wouldn't want this every week, let's be clear, but I thought in this spot, you know, it did a good job of like really setting everything up, you know. For anyone that maybe didn't know their history together, it did a good job of like setting up that aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I thought Copeland had good delivery. It wasn't, you know, the I'm going to a dark place, you know, WWE bullshit that he was doing that would kind of suck. Um, and uh, I thought this was a good sit down. I thought it was a, a good promo. I'm not going to, again, not like a one I'll look back on at the end of the year is like one of the best things that happened on TV, but good. I thought it was good, and I, I still think Adam Copeland is uh, delivering every time he's been on TV for AEW so far. I, I don't know that he's really a meaningful draw for the company, which has always been kind of the big question with him outside of the John Cena run um, and his subsequent heel run after that, but I think uh, right now he's at least providing some solid segments, and I'll take it. I saw some pushback on the fact that he said he wasn't here to come for the world title, and Considering everything that happened with MJF and Adam Cole, I kind of understand that. But Copeland is 50. He has spinal stenosis and he has a triple fusion neck surgery. He's coming in here as a 50-year-old. I I think it's okay that he's not here to chase the world title because this is a big-time wrestling company and he's almost, in essence in a kind of a roundabout way, putting them over by not wanting to go for the world title, realizing that he probably isn't deserving of the world title at this point in his career over a lot of these guys. And he just wants to go have fun with his buddy. And it's different from the MJF Cole stuff because you have a 25 plus year television history of these guys being buddies. They've hosted their own podcast. They were a tag team in WWE, and they helped make the uh, TLC match famous. Mm -hmm. I have no issue with Copeland saying, I just came here because I wanted to finish my career with my buddy Jay. And to me, it doesn't even, it's not even bothersome that they kind of broke kayfabe a little bit by calling him Jay and not Christian. Like, everybody knows it's Jay. He was retired at one point, too. To me, a lot of this is a big nothing burger. Like, as far as like the con- the concern, I thought it was good. I thought it worked really well. I thought it worked really well within the context of this story, and that is a bigger thing than it just working well overall for me. And I was happy with this. Yeah, I thought this was decent. Um... You know, good even. Um, I, you know, I will, I will acquiesce that him saying that he didn't want to be the world champion, you know, probably shouldn't have been said because if you're in wrestling, you ostensibly, unless you're like a real weirdo character like Danhausen, your character should want to be the world champion, I guess. Uh, but I think, frankly, uh, you know, for someone Adam Copeland's age, it's fine for him to say that, I reckon. And more importantly, do you really want him in the position of world champion for AEW? Because <laughs> no. I, I don't think we're really going to see many fantastic matches from him. I think he's fine at this point. 
Um, you know, Luchasaurus isn't exactly the best wrestler he'll end up facing, but that match was just okay. Um, I, you know, I think it's fine. It was fine. Yeah. Like yeah. him saying that he's not here to chase the world title, but he's here to, to finish his career with his friend Jay, I think is fine. That doesn't mean he doesn't care about the world title. It doesn't mean that he doesn't necessarily want it. That's not the reason he's here, but we all know motivations can change. So yeah. I'm, I was fine with this. Yeah. Uh, next up, we had Wardlow against Ryan Nemeth, uh, or Nemeth. Uh, Nemeth got killed. Wardlow power bombed him once, and the ref stopped it. Um, Tony Schiavone came into the ring immediately after and uh, asked Wardlow why he's back, and Wardlow just silently held up his wrist, which was taped, uh, and on the tape was written MJF, and then Wardlow knocked Tony Schiavone on his ass, uh, just kind of brushing past him as he walked out. Um, God, this would have been so cool nine months ago. <laughs> oh, this yeah. would have been so great. Now, I don't, I don't fully, care. I don't fully understand why we waited so long on this. Uh, and when I say fully understand, I should say I don't at all understand. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, we got a backstage promo with Renee again. Uh, hardest, hardest working woman in wrestling. Asking Kenny Omega how he's feeling ahead of the Fletcher match. And he's just doing kind of a... You know, a generic babyface promo saying he's going to be, beat Fletcher and then the Callis family. And then maybe he'll get the AEW World Championship. And then MGF walks in, shakes his hand, uh, and then whispers 13 days to him. And Omega says, we'll see about that. Um, so that's setting up pretty quickly, I assume, an MJF Kenny Omega World Championship match to uh, determine if MGF will break that. They should have set this up a couple weeks ago. <laughs> um kind of rushing this but i guess if you're going to devote like every segment on uh or one segment i should say on every show from this point forward to it you can get a sufficient build but you know it does feel like it's starting a touch late it is starting late and quite frankly i don't necessarily care that it's starting late i I don't even think you have to do this story but i do think if you were going to do this story that you should have done it a lot earlier than yeah I mean, frankly, if you just started it two weeks ago, it would have made more sense, I feel like. But you mm-hmm. know, we start hinting at it to help build the match. But look, if they do it in, you know, um on the not this weekend's collision, but the next one and have a segment every week or every show for that, you know, until until then, as I stumble over my words, it'll end up fine. You know, uh it could have been bigger though. Um it feels like they're blowing in a pay per view match on a collision show. Um, like a big pay per view, like a drawing match. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. It's kind of weird. Um, kind of weird. Uh, okay. Speaking of uh, of weird, we're back to Roderick Strong's house. Um, and God bless it, Tyler. I'm so tired of this. Uh, I, I kind of just hope that. A kayfabe sinkhole opens under this house and sucks everyone down into it, and we never see any of them again um, on television. It's just it Fuck sucks. This it sucks so much. We get again. Okay, listen. It's okay if you want to do comedy segments sometimes on your wrestling show. I I just advise including jokes in your show. Uh, these ain't funny. Call Stock Richie Kawa. He'll teach you how to be funny. I mean, my God, uh, I, they have at least one stand-up comedian, uh, Chris Harrington, under contract as their stats guy. Is he really um, stand-up comic? I thought he did stand-up comedy. If I'm at completely off my rocker here, that's you know, sorry. Uh, I'll just go back to talking about my hypothetical Swerve Strickland Brian Danielson match from Last Collision. Because um, you and I both joined VOW after Chris Harrington ended up leaving for AEW, so mm-hmm. to me, that's a genuine question for me. Yeah, I, I swear that he did uh, stand up for a while. Um, uh, now maybe I'm wrong, but I I really thought he uh, he did. Um, uh, but yeah, it's um, God. This sucks. I hate, this. So. I hate it so much. It's the it's fact worth- that Adam Cole left Roderick Strong's house gives me hope that it's done. 
Man, maybe he set fire to it as he left. Um, Please, for the love of God. This I, I hate this so much. It's the worst storyline in wrestling in 2023. Um, I, I feel extremely confident saying this. Uh, and like, oh no, uh, Roderick Strong is upset because his peanut butter and jelly sandwich has crust has crust on it and we get these zoom ins on adam cole's wacky face which is the one he's done in every single segment since the first one with mjf now that Um, was me when i was six i hated crust i still don't like it but i eat it because you know i'm an adult who finds this funny i don't again there's there aren't jokes that's not good it's not fun it's not funny um and yeah, I just I I despise it. I hope it. It's... I hate it. 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 Uh, Tony Shavani is in the ring and introduces the Callis family, so we get a long promo. Uh, first of all, we get a really good powerhouse Hobbs promo. Uh, oh, I have a, I have a problem with this. Oh, you have a problem with this? Okay. How old is Will Hobbs? He's what thirty four years old. Yeah, about that. Yeah, mid thirties. So, correct me if I'm wrong. I swore I heard him say that his grandma took him to a show in 1998. Yeah. How yeah. would Chris Jericho have been his favorite wrestler when he wasn't even formative enough to have an opinion on wrestling? He was seven years old. In 98? Yeah. Uh, Hobbs was. Oh. Not, uh, not Jericho. My brain is absolutely destroyed. Yeah, he would have yeah, been Yeah, and Hobbs is 32. So, I'm not uh, going to edit that out because I deserve the no, I'm gonna, Now I'm going to make it like a real big deal. So <laughs> 2023 minus 32 because I'm an asshole. It's yeah. 1991. Uh, 1998 is seven years after that. So <sighs> sorry, I'm a jerk. <laughs> I deserve it. I, I deserve just it. just mess with you a little bit. I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, Odie, this is your fault. I don't know how, but it's your fault. Tyler needs a nap. Um yeah, I do. Get Tyler a nap. Um, <laughs> I need to give you clearer epilepsy med. That, that's what I need to do. If you need to step off to do that, I can cover this for a little no. bit. Um, no. All right. Uh, I like the promo. He said basically that he went to a show with his grandmother and his Jericho got in his grandma's face and uh, told her to shut up and told uh, Hobbs to sit his ass down. And so he's been angry for 25 years. Uh, and so he came back and he heard him. And... Uh, and uh it was if great. that story is true and somebody finds the the show the on film oh god we got um, the date i wonder if it was a house show man that that's a that's a that's a great story that could just end up being a phenomenal lie you, oh <laughs> you know what show that would have been what uh, Super Brawl 8, where Chris Jericho defeated Juventud Guerrero in a title versus mask match. No way. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, we'll have to get on the WWE Network and take a look. Um, if no one else has on Twitter. Um, but yeah, this was a good promo. Then, uh, uh, Calla said that, uh, they don't tell how people like Hobbs to bottle it up in this family that we let you be what you are and what Hobbs is is a killing machine and then we've been undefeated in four months except for one match where Sammy Guevara was hurt by Jericho I love them turning this into it and then my favorite part of it and as great Hob- as the Hobbs promo was I love this even just a little more uh Callis said we had to go and get a scab worker <laughs> Keeps referring to Kyle Fletcher as a scab. As great an athlete he is, he let us down. He screwed the Don Callis family. Fletcher comes out hot and says he's going to prove himself by beating Omega. And their match is right next. And then a commentary for the entire match, uh, which was a pretty damn good match. Um, uh, Callis is just burying Fletcher the entire time. And it's it's wonderful. Um uh, I thought I went four and a half on this match. Uh, I liked it a lot, um, especially the se- the second half of it. Um, really good work between these two. And Omega eventually won with a one-winged angel, um, leading to Callus throwing a hissy fit on commentary. Um, and then uh, says he should retire, get a day job, and quit the business. <laughs> I, I, I love it. Now... Um, God bless Don Callis. Yeah, we're we're I think we're clearly setting up Will Osprey breaking from Callis and coming in full time. Hopefully, 
uh, as a baby face, um, you know, given the connection between Fletcher and uh, Osprey. Uh, but, you know, Callus is a great heel. Now, I do wonder if maybe we've uh, kind of screwed the pooch on Takeshita by doing that uh, regular, you know, thing that uh, Tony Khan likes to do, which is start something and then put it on the back burner for months and then just resume it like nothing uh... ever happened, except the fact that it loses a lot of momentum. And I think, you know, look at Keith Lee, look at Wardlow. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and I worry a little bit we're doing that with Takeshita. Um, but, you know, here we are. Uh, next up, we come back from commercial. And Lance Archer is just uh, just murdering Barrett Brown. It's a great, it's a little squash. Fun. Always good to see Lance Archer. Nothing much to really note there. Oh, there's one thing that we need to note. And as he's kicking Barrett Brown's ass down to the ring, Justin Roberts, the dapper oh, yeah. dapper, um, and yes. kicking his opponent down to the ring from that was, Hearn, that Texas. Was good. That was good. <laughs> that, well, it's it's just a perfect improvised line. Little things matter, and little things make shows better. And this is yeah. one of them. Yeah, that's You'll ne- you done. probably won't remember it in ten years. You probably won't remember it in ten minutes. But in that moment, it was, it was perfect. Funny. It was great. Uh, we got Swerve and Nana talking about uh, Swerve's new song. Nana's hyping Swerve up, but Swerve's grumpy because he was cost his TNT Championship opportunity by Hangman uh, because he lost to him, um, uh, or was was cost his match, I should say, on Dynamite last week. So, good continuation of the feud. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got to the Sting uh, retirement promo. Uh, look, it's not like Brian Danielson in Seattle or anything, but it's you know it was a good little promo. Set up some stuff. Um, great booze up for for Hulk Hogan. That that was great. yeah. The crowd bury Hulk Hogan was fantastic. Extremely organic and great stuff. Um, look, uh, I'm not going to spend all the time uh, that I could to uh, the next RJ City Tony Storm segment. Um, look, it was a little more developed than last week. I don't. I just don't think this is going to help Tony Storm in wrestling uh, as a wrestling character it's uh it it's not the worst idea on paper but it's just not working i don't think um i did laugh at where in the cue cards uh or the title card i should say for the silent movie during commercial he promises her the finest things including a pearl necklace she slaps him and then it says, does show i meant the jewelry uh, I thought that was a good bit. I got a chuckle, sensible chuckle out of it. Unfortunately uh, for me, um, when they do the picture in picture, when you watch on the TNT app the next day, you don't get to see the picture in picture. So I didn't get to see the segment. Ah, well, that's a bummer. Um, uh, I don't know. You really missed out on much though. So yeah, uh, she was promised a butler. So that may be the Mariah May uh, id tree into this. If you introduce Mar- Mariah May as a butler. I'm going to bury the fuck out of it. Get ready. Get your shovel oh, ready, buddy. Good lord. Um, we got the sit down with Nick, Nick Nick Wayne and his mother and JR. Um, shockingly, Nick Wayne's uh, mother, a non professional actress, uh, was not a good actor. Uh, and people like thought they were really pointing something out there. Um, I, you know what? Did she you was have expectations. Fine. She was uh, fine. It wasn't good. But yeah. Like, it, she was playing herself. Like, look, at the end of the day, Nick Wayne's mom is hot. Fine by me. Uh, this did, uh, you know, I, I, I wasn't impressed by this. Wayne's got a way to go with charisma and that kind of stuff. Um, but we did cr- get Christian Cage coming in and saying to Nick Wayne's mother, you should have picked up the phone. And then Darby immediately kills them both outside. Um, and Love apparently sh- shoot busts his uh, Nick Wayne's tooth. Uh, yeah. They throw back to the announce desk. And I always like these kind of things uh, where Darby Allen throws Nick Wayne's ass out through the stage to the shock of everyone and keeps beating on him. Luchasaurus and Christian come out uh, to beat down Darby. And then uh, Sting it goes to lock Christian. He makes the save, goes to lock Christian in the Scorpion Death Lock, but Luchasaurus makes the save. Uh, Nick Wayne apparently busted a tooth down to the nerve, mm-hmm. which, which sucks. 
Yeah, which means that sucker is going to have to either be completely extracted and you put in an implant or yeah. you're going to have to um, do a full root canal, which at that point, considering where the tooth's at, a root canal and then a crown makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, maybe, sucks maybe. that as an 18 year old. Yeah. You, that happens. Like, that's a bad night at the office. Maybe you can talk to Juice Robinson about his gold tooth. Um, is that a shoot gold tooth or does he just put a I cap on it? I, I don't know. I have no idea, to be honest. Um, I've never noticed it before. Um, I will say. Doesn't mean anything. Just didn't pick up on it before. Uh, Renee backstage with best friends Chris Statlander and Hook and Orange Cassidy. Uh, Chris sets up a match with Willow Nightingale, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, and Orange Cassidy talks about how he's got to prove something with the Intercontinental or International Championship, setting up his... Uh, not a dream match <laughs> on Battle of the Belts. And then we got the Battle Royale, the Dynamite Dozen Battle Royale. And uh, early in its run, AEW was a really good Battle Royale company. And then whoever it was that put together those kind of really well done, interconnected stuff uh, isn't getting listened to as much <laughs> because... I wonder if they're out of the company. Maybe Barry Whitmer was the guy. Like maybe uh, this is a hypothetical because it would make sense that the, the battle Royals have kind of gone downhill, that the person who is doing the battle Royals is not in the company anymore. So, yeah. Or I don't know. They just, or maybe they just don't spend as much time planning them because early on, you know, like they're, they're never great matches or anything, but early on they would, they were very intricate like every everybody did something that mattered, and we don't have that anymore with AEW Battle Royals. We just have we have some spots that matter, and then we have other spots where like Matt Seidel just gets dumped after a minute, and hey, work smarter, not harder. Yeah, um, this was fine. I mean, I don't really even have that much stuff talking about it. They're obviously setting up something with Daniel Garcia and his dancing and the the phantom limb of the JES. Um, that was the biggest thing. And also MJF paying off Dustin Rhodes to do the shattered dreams on juice Robinson, who eventually recovered and then won the match. That was um, funny, by the way. I yeah. That yeah. I, 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 that popped me. I will give them credit for that. Um, and that was it. Those were the only important things that happened until the finish. Uh, you know, Garcia looked good. He got several key eliminations and then uh, got dumped. Uh, Max Caster hung around till the end with Juice and uh, uh, Garcia. Garcia got dumped by Caster when Garcia was trying to dump Juice. And then uh, they had a decent little closing section, which wasn't fantastic. It was it was just fine. And then Juice, um, Juice dumps... Uh, Caster after uh, Caster is given the WWE distraction of Jay White attacking MJF at commentary. At least it wasn't a theme song. Um, and then, um, yeah, this was this was fine. It was uh, a dynamite. It was this. It was a battle royal. Uh, the last half hour of the show was was weak uh, in general. I thought uh, compared to the rest of it. Overall, I'd say this is I don't know probably a seven out of ten. Um, the Roderick Strong stuff is easily the worst stuff on television these days. I, I feel yep. pretty safe saying that. Um, and uh, I, I don't just mean AEW TV. I mean wrestling TV. Um, I feel pretty safe saying that. Now, maybe there's some secret segments on NXT that are just awful, but I'm not watching. But as far as the stuff that I'm catching, it stinks, and it's easily the, the worst stuff on there. And that's the show. Um I don't really have anything else to talk about. Uh, I'm I'm excited for Mr. Cohen Romero tonight. Um, and I, it's it's a true lucha match. It's two out of three falls. Mm -hmm. Yep, you got the old Australian rules as they refer to them. Um, I I'm looking forward to it. I'll have to watch it later because uh, I'm going to a movie. But yeah, it's a DVR show that will actually be watched <laughs> as compared to uh, maybe some other rampages that I am behind on. Any other thoughts you want to share, Tyler? No. Happy. This is good dynamite. It feels like we're in a better direction than we were a few weeks ago. Not everything's perfect, but I'll take improvement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is trending upwards. Uh, I will definitely say that. Uh, this is still, I think, easily the weakest year of AEW's history. Uh, calendar year. Um, yeah. Um, I did, I will say 
quickly that I sat down and watched the highlight matches of Ring of Honor on Honor Club uh, over the past week or two. Um, and the thing I really want to say is Athena is the best uh, North America-based uh, women's wrestler right now. Uh, she is fantastic. It's kind of a shame that her best stu- that this great stuff she's having is uh, hidden away on the service as compared to being on AEW TV. And hopefully we get her promoted up sooner the better uh, because she's just really damn good. Um, so there you go. Yeah, that's our show. Good show. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, we'll uh, hopefully have some good stuff for talk about next week and uh, go right ahead. This is all you, man. Yeah. Um, get us out of here. This is where I forget all the end of the stuff. Uh, if, <laughs> if you, it, uh, thank you for, very much for listening, everybody. If you haven't uh, um, already done so, please like, comment, subscribe, give us a five star review. Um, make sure you find us on YouTube as well, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at the Real Forno. You can find me on Blue Sky also at the Real Forno. Blue Sky that social or wh- whatever that gimmick is, and you can find Fred on there as well. And bada bing, bada boom. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Have a good one, everyone. Hello, Voices of Wrestling listener. Dave Ryan here. Have you ever wondered to yourself, how many hidden gems are hidden away inside the last years of World Championship Wrestling? Have you ever asked yourself how many tenuous gags can be made about the name Mike Enos? And have you ever thought about what it sounds like for two Irishmen to interpret a very chaotic company through its B-show? The answers to all this and more are just a click away. Check out Days of Thunder every second Thursday on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Hello, do you like New Japan Pro Wrestling? Are you a Shin Nihon freak? If so, check out the Super Jcast with Joel and Damon on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. And even if you fucking hate New Japan Pro Wrestling, listen to the Super Jcast anyway. Not just for our great show reviews, analysis, and pastrami sandwiches, mm-hmm. but there's also usually some dick jokes somewhere in the obligatory opening 30 minutes of absolute nonsense we chat about every single week. That's the Super Jcast for all the best talk about New Japan Pro Wrestling, crisps, and pornography.